Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online as well. If you're here in person, please take a moment to fill up, fill out rather the friendship pads that are on the pews. And as you're doing that, I'll share a couple of announcements about the life of the church. Um, one of our choir members, Dawson Trotman, has his senior recital this evening. It's at 8 p.m. and it's at the Macintosh Theater on campus. I think that's North Campus. Okay, somebody gave me a nod. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, the, our trustees are meeting tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. That meeting will take place via Zoom. We have a couple of memorial services coming up in the next couple of weeks. First of all, this coming Saturday on April 13th, we'll have the memorial service for Brian Suits at 11 a.m. And then the following Friday, April 19th at 11 a.m. will be the memorial service for Christine Miller. So thank you to those of you who have signed up to help at one or both of those services. And um, we, we will be together in community as we remember their lives and celebrate their lives. Next Sunday, following 10 a.m. worship, we'll have the final contemporary issues session of the season. And the topic is how youth are responding to the climate crisis. So we'll be welcoming a member of the local chapter of the Ann Arbor Sunrise Movement. And we'll also be welcoming from Washington, D.C., Brooks Barrent, who is the environmental justice minister for the United Church of Christ's national staff. So that's at 11 o'clock next Sunday morning, and we hope you can join us for that meaningful discussion in which both of those people will give presentations, and then we'll engage in a dialogue about that. And finally, from me, a family camp is coming up. It's May 15th through 17th. It's not too late to register. It's a wonderful time of uh, fellowship and community building with members of FCC. We'll go over to Tower Hill Camp on the west side of the state. So hopefully, weather permitting, we'll spend lots of good time outdoors and um, be right on Lake Michigan. So it's a wonderful time, May, 5th, uh, May 17th to 19th. And I'd like to invite Mike Creel, the chair of our stewardship committee, up to make an important Important announcement. Great. Great, thank you, and good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Mike Creel, uh, and I lead the stewardship committee. And we, as you hopefully are aware, we started the campaign this year on March 18th. You all should have gotten a home mailing as well as an email, and it's the Let's Grow Together campaign. Um, we are really excited, though, today to start the first of four member stories, which you'll hear over the next four weeks. Um, and these are opportunities for you to hear from various members of the congregation as to the importance of what uh, First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor means to them, and they're really, really well done. And we're excited to start those, those campaigns today. Um, so far, we're making progress on the campaign. We've had 56 of you, uh, either individuals or families, um, already pledged from a financial perspective, and we're just over $169,000, which is about 30% of our goal of 580,000. So if you have not yet had a chance um, to do so, you can dig through your mail, uh, pull out the pledge card, get it into the church, or go online. And it's very simple to be able to do that. And not only from a financial perspective, but also from a time and talent perspective, we want to hear from you. Um, the church does so much good, and, and it's because of you, the congregation. So we're going to get things started on the member stories, and, and Cheryl Kerr's is, is the first, um, uh, and I think you'll just really enjoy um, just a fabulous uh, demonstration by Cheryl of what the church means to her. So thanks so much. Well, my husband and I have been attending services at FCC for approximately four Well, my husband and I have been attending services at FCC for approximately four to five years. There have been many meaningful experiences, and I must say that the top several of them have been mission and outreach activities. One of the ones that happened recently that I absolutely loved was when members of the congregation got together and assembled lunch bags to give to the Hope Clinic so that they could give them to their clients. It was a really exciting time. Four of us set up the assembly before church 
And after church, I rushed up there to get things started and saw people already standing in line, like horses at a starting gate, saying, what can we do, what can we do? And it was truly joyful. The other thing that I have found particularly meaningful at the church, and my husband shares this with me, is that we love music, including choral music. And we feel so blessed by the musical program that happens here at First Congregational. It is truly top notch. When my husband and I are here listening to that, I feel a sense of pure joy. It has really been one of the biggest pluses of our attendance here at FCC for us. I choose to commit my resources to FCC because I really believe in the values of this church and the mission of this church. Our doors are open to all, and I believe that is absolutely true. And I believe as a member of the Christian community, it is my responsibility to contribute to that in whatever way I can both time and talent, but also financially. I do feel that this church spends its money in a very fiscally responsible manner, and for that reason, I have absolutely no qualms for giving. Every time I step up to the lectern, I have this amazing feeling. I know many people in the congregation, and I meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, either in a social setting or on a committee. When I step up at the lectern and I look out, I think not only do I see this beautiful church that is my spiritual home, but I see all these people that are my spiritual family to which I am so blessed to belong. for that spiritual family, let us continue to prepare our hearts and minds to worship our awesome and loving God.
Good morning. I'm here to lead us in the call to worship, the prayer of invocation, and the Lord's Prayer. We'll begin with a call to worship. We rejoice in the one who leads beside still waters. Christ our shepherd shows the way we should go so that the name of God will be glorified. Through all manner of, though all manner of evil befall us, we will not be afraid. We are never away from the love and mercy of the Lord. And we will be with you forever. Let us pray. To you, our God, we open our minds. To you, we open prayer and our worship and thanksgiving. Amen. May you always know us, show us the path in which we should walk, and lead us in truth and teach us. For you alone are our dear, and God in whom we trust. Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Sustain our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Seated, I'd like to invite any children to come forward. Hey, Zinnia and Azalea, good morning. Come on up. How are you? Yeah. Hey, Brooke, wow, what a beautiful dress you have today. Hey, Ty. Hi, Nate. Wow, what do you have? A kitty helmet. Wow, that is so cool. Who else is here? Hey. How's it going, Maddie and Amelia? How are you all? Good? Good. Okay, do you, any of you know of some big exciting thing that's happening tomorrow? Have you heard of the eclipse? Yeah. Yeah, you've heard of it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. To me and Ty have the glasses at our school. Our teachers have them. Oh, you have glasses? The um, teachers are going to give it out and... All the classes are going Good morning. to be out at the same time. Oh, so cool. So they have... You see Ty and... Okay, and, you might see Ty. Um, and some animals might be um, confused. Some of the animals might be confused. Um, Colin and Hannah's um, cat is... Uh -huh. um, Colin and Hannah's cat, are, is it scared or potentially scared from the eclipse, from well, it getting dark? No. No? Uh, it's like, I forgot its name, but it stays, huh? what it's, it's called, but it stays up all night. And, okay, yeah. Uh, so you forgot the cat's name and what it's called, but it stays up all night, and so the eclipse might confuse it, because it will seem like it's nighttime during the day. Yeah, because... Got it. So you mentioned you have glasses to watch the eclipse. I yeah. heard, so and these glasses will be good, right? These glasses? No. No? Okay. I have a whole toolbox. What about these glasses? These are my sunglasses. No. 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 Why not? There's sun. Wait, 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 wait. Special glasses. 
professional glasses. Okay, you're right. I remember. I heard that welding glasses would work. No. No. No, they actually will. That's a surprise. But not everybody has these, right? Because welding involves oh, really bright light. Okay. Oh, ta da! Yeah. Now, yeah, okay. Glasses. These yeah. glasses. But these are the ones. Light, but light. Wait. Light. Wait. Wait. Oz, but white. Your, oh, these are like yours, but yours are white? No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. In our class, um, uh, um, we have those eclipse glasses, but they're white. Oh, you have them, but they're white. Nice. And I heard a lot of students in Ann Arbor are going to get eclipse glasses because they're white. And or eclipse glasses that might be different colors. Tyler, you're going to get them. But I thought, you know, today in church, we're going to be talking about a shepherd boy named David. And David has an encounter with a giant named Goliath. And he's a shepherd, and he can beat this giant and help protect his entire family. Isn't that amazing? And, his, and, and all the people in his country, because he had certain tools as a shepherd, just kind of like I had some tools in this toolbox that will help protect us from the eclipse. And I was thinking, you all might like a pair of these, and I'd love to give you a pair. But I was also thinking some people out there might like to have a pair of glasses to watch the eclipse. So could you help me give glasses to the people out there? Yeah. To protect them? OK. Can I have two? Yeah, you can have two. But will you help give out three or four pairs to people out in the church? OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray first. Oh, yeah, Nate, you have got your helmet back here that can also protect your head. Right? So you could wear your glasses and your helmet at the same time. But let's say a prayer first. And then as you're heading downstairs, while these people are saying hi to, to each other, you can also give them glasses. And they'll reach up their hands if they want them. How about that? OK. okay. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for the reminder, for the reminder that, even that even one person can make a difference in many people's lives. Thank you for these special glasses that will help protect our eyes during the wonderful eclipse. And thank you for friends who teach us about them. Amen. Okay, as these kiddos are handing out glasses and heading downstairs, I invite you to also give the peace of Christ to one another. Peace be with you. All right, hand those out. I'll be so excited. A couple of weeks ago, somebody called the church asking for help. They just needed a little bit of help to be able to pay their DTE bill that month. And we were able to help. During spring break, a grandfather took a new annual tradition with his granddaughters. They went to the grocery store and bought food. And then they brought it here to the church's food pantry. And then that food went on to Hope Clinic. Last Monday, missions and outreach members came to the church 
to take all of the home goods and supplies you had gathered during Lent to Jewish family services to welcome refugees to our community. The impacts of you sharing your gifts of time and talent and treasure are immeasurable. Let us give with joy and hopeful anticipation. Let's pray. 
Oh God, sometimes in life we feel that we have so little to offer, but today we are reminded that one person sharing their gifts and skills with faith and courage makes a difference. In this season of stewardship, help us remember that what we have to give matters. Thank you for these gifts and so many others that we give with hope and joy. Amen. Please be seated. I made my first slingshot with my dad. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but it was so much fun. We found a stick that was shaped like a Y and grabbed a couple of rubber bands and tied them to the tip top edges of the Y. D did you all do stuff like this too? Oh yeah, okay. And then I got some peas, green peas, and shot them places with my special slingshot. <laughs> my dad is the best. We had so much fun together. He taught me to, to see things in new ways and, and to have fun and adventure and enjoy life. His name is David. And today we focus on a different David, King David. Before he was king, when he was a shepherd boy, with a sling, but not a slingshot of his own. Our first scripture today is part of a story that will be very familiar to many of you. It's the story of David and Goliath, but let's situate it before we dive in. This story happens in the Valley of Elah, which is southwest of modern day Jerusalem. If Jerusalem's up here, kind of in the Northeast, and Gaza's down here, Elah is like here, it's not quite halfway between Jerusalem and Gaza, um, but there it is. The Philistine army in this story is stationed on the South Highlands in that valley, and the Israelites under Saul's leadership are on the North Highlands, and they are in a stalemate. 
Now David is a shepherd boy. He is the youngest of eight sons of Jesse of Bethlehem. Jesse was the grandson of Boaz and Ruth. So David is a shepherd. His dad is a sheep breeder. He has seven older brothers, three of whom are with Saul's army, stationed and deadlocked opposite the Philistine army on the highlands surrounding the Valley of Elah. Scholars believe David lived in the 11th century BC or BCE, and he was a teenager when this was happening. So maybe this encounter happens sometime around the 1030s BC or BCE, 3,000 years ago. In the stalemate, the Philistines send forward one of their warriors to challenge Saul's warriors to single combat in hopes of finally resolving this stalemate. The Philistine warrior named Goliath is huge and intimidating. He had the most impressive and heavy armor and a spear that was so sharp it could pierce through anything. Whomever won, Goliath said, would take as servants the other's army. Now Saul and his warriors were terrified. Nobody, nobody wanted to fight Goliath. So for 40 days, Goliath came forward, and for 40 days, nobody from Saul's army wanted to fight. Now meanwhile, Jesse sends his youngest son David to the battlefront with provisions, food, for his three oldest sons and for their unit commander. When David arrives, he goes to the front line and he sees Goliath coming out for this daily challenge and he sees the Israelite soldiers running away and he's curious, what's going on here? So he asks them and they talk about the challenge and also that whomever successfully battles Goliath will earn great favor with King Saul. David's older brother is annoyed with David for even asking those questions and for his curiosity. But David believes he can fight Goliath. He goes to Saul to tell him he can fight this Philistine warrior. Saul replies that David cannot, in fact, fight this Philistine warrior because he is too young. And this Our scripture from 1 Samuel 17 is David's response to Saul. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. And we know what happens, right? David defeats Goliath. David versus Goliath, a story told over and over again over these thousands of years and still today, a metaphor for hope. Any time in which an underdog is going up against someone or something in power. David, the small shepherd boy, going into an impossible battle with Goliath, the seasoned champion warrior. Just this week, I did an internet search for news stories with the word Goliath. Countless popped up from the last week or so. David and Goliath, local and international news stories from almost every sector of society. A news article about a local tax policy fight in Kansas City, which quoted a citizen saying, we beat billionaire Goliath. 
in their fight to avoid additional taxes supporting professional sports teams. There was a story about a startup artificial intelligence tech company fighting the Goliath of established corporations of the tech industry. There was a story from Florence, Italy, about curators, art curators, taking on Goliath in an attempt to end tacky art souvenirs. <laughs> there was a story about Finland anticipating a potential David and Goliath battle at their Arctic border with Russia. And of course, this season wouldn't be complete with multiple David and Goliath stories in university papers about their school's place in the NCAA men and women's tournaments. Indiana women hope to slay Goliath set to face South Carolina in the Sweet 16. If you've been paying attention, you know that Indiana did not win, but that's beside the point. <laughs> You've seen and heard the stories, right? All echoing some version of the primary moral of this biblical story we learned in childhood. With great faith in God, even one unlikely underdog can go forward with courage and prevail over the daunting giant. Everyone loves a good underdog story, am I right? David had many roles in his lifetime. We meet him here as a shepherd boy, but we leave him in this sto story as a warrior. Eventually, he will succeed Saul as king, fulfilling the prophet Samuel's anointing of David when he was 12, years before this encounter with Goliath. And of course, we know David as a poet to whom many of the Psalms are attributed. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When we look back on our life journeys, now or in the years to come, so many things can be said about us and who we were at any stage in our lives. Child, student, friend, parent. Many of us will have multiple careers and professions like David. His foundations as a shepherd so influence who David becomes. I think those foundations can offer us new insights into both the David and Goliath story and to the prominence of the shepherd metaphor that is so prevalent in scripture and is used time and again in describing Jesus. You see, the message that we can do great things with faith and that each individual, whatever their place in society, can have a role to play in building the beloved community is so powerful and beautiful. And there is more to this story about David, the shepherd boy, that I think is lost on so many of us because we are not so familiar with the realities of shepherding or pastoralism. Not pastoring like I do, but the form of animal husbandry common to nomadic people of caring for herds of animals in large open areas of land. Anthropologists believe that nomadic pastoralism developed between 8500 and 6500 BCE, so thousands and thousands of years before this story with David. We think Moses was a shepherd. And even today, though anything but farming is very distant to most of us here in the United States, scholars estimate that 200 to 500 million people practice pastoralism in 75% of the world's countries. Shepherding is not for the faint of heart. 
It involves long periods of time away from home. As David told Saul when he was pleading his case, it requires strength and bravery to fight animals who come to attack the flock. It requires a long view to be able to anticipate the threats from weather patterns or from other animals and the immediate knowledge of your herd to move them and communicate with them. And also a good shepherd dog or two to help along the way. The vision of a young shepherd boy who almost comically couldn't move when he put on Saul's armor doesn't account for the physical fitness David would have had. It doesn't account for the expertise he would have developed as a shepherd. The agility of his mind to adapt to changing circumstances to protect his herd and the agility of his physical body. And beyond all that, when David picked up those five rocks on his way to fight Goliath, we are reminded that David, as a shepherd, was also a skilled slinger. As a slinger, David fit into one of the three major specialties of ancient warfare, archery or slinging. The two others were heavy infantry in combat. David wasn't a little girl like me, shooting peas with his homemade slingshot. <laughs> he was a skilled slinger, using rocks, his shepherd's sling and his precise aim, just as he would have used in the fields to fend off predators from his flock. Goliath armored up and prepared for an up-close battle with David, but David was fast and able to fight Goliath from a distance, slinging one rock and striking him right between the eyes. This knowledge of David's skills and training as a shepherd and how it prepared him for battle with Goliath doesn't undermine the moral about the importance of faith, but it does inform the metaphor that so pervades our culture. Author Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book titled David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Tackling Giants. He writes and talks about how part of the message of David and Goliath is that underdogs are in fact well positioned to take on daunting giants. Underdogs can be more agile. They aren't so immersed in systems and structures of power that they have to play by the rules of the game. They can use their unique expertise and experience to inform their creativity and take steps that people in power might not be able to take. Giants might have lots of armor and power but like Goliath, they move slowly. They might be so set in their ways, like expecting that up-close combat, that they don't anticipate attacks from far away. They might be so sure that they can crush that little shepherd boy that their confidence gets the better of them. I am so curious and excited about how knowing these things about shepherds and specifically David the shepherd can inform our understanding of Jesus's shepherding, references to God as shepherd in scripture, and Jesus's call for his disciples and therefore all of us to be shepherds as well. Like here, in John 21, when Jesus appears to his disciples for the fourth time following his death. First, he appears to Mary as a gardener on Easter morning, and then later on that same day, he appears to the disciples locked up in their house, but that time Thomas wasn't there, and he doubts it, remember? So Jesus comes back a third time, eight days later, and he appears to the, them again, and Thomas is at the house that time, so he does believe. But then on this fourth time, Jesus appears to the disciples some time later, scripture tells us, when they are fishing at the Sea of Tiberias. 
Jesus, not yet identified, tells them to cast their net off the right side of the boat. You remember? And then later that day, after they have had dinner together, Jesus and Simon have this interaction in which Jesus asks Simon Peter three times if he loves him, a seeming resolution to the three times Peter denied Jesus before the crucifixion. Here's John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked this a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I'm thinking today about how we are all called to be shepherds, to feed and care for Jesus' sheep. Being a shepherd was a tough job. And with great faith and skills, David did it. Being a more metaphorical shepherd disciple these days isn't easy either. And as you know, that work takes grit, grit and so many forms. Raising children, loving partners, caring for friends, having meaningful careers, working to make the world a better place for all. Each one of us unlikely shepherds has a role to play. Each one of us is invited to bring our unique skills and strengths and courage to the work. Jesus, like his ancestor David before him, was a fierce protector, an agile leader, a person of deep courage and strength. Like David before him, Jesus shaped our understanding of a shepherd God who will walk with and protect us even in the deepest valleys and lay down beside us in the fields, restore our souls, and guide us with grace and goodness and mercy. Even after his death, Jesus came back to his disciples, to his flock, to feed them and to encourage them to keep going, to take up the mantle themselves.
Let's continue in a time of prayer. We'll begin with a brief moment of silence. Oh God, you are our shepherd, infinitely caring and loving, ever fierce in your protection of your flock, all people. Guide us as we learn about David in the weeks to come. Open our hearts to new understandings of the fullness of humanity as we explore the strengths and imperfections together. Open our minds to insights about David's leadership during this time when our country anticipates the election of new leaders at all levels of government. Open our awareness to the needs of one another and our world as we imagine the possibilities for our future with unyielding hope. God, as we anticipate the awe-inspiring eclipse tomorrow, we pray for our home, this earth of beautiful green pastures and still waters and life-sustaining energy. Help us to experience the awe and assurance of the flowing over abundance of this life. Help us to relish in the wonders of this life whenever we can. Help us to give freely. Help us to know there is a way for every human, each sheep in your flock, to be fed, to have their needs met, and help us know how to live accordingly. God, we pray for those who find themselves in life's darkest valleys this morning. We pray for those in grief, in sickness, in great need. We pray for them the comforting reassurances of our faith and actions and support that make a difference. We pray for those living in the midst of violence, war, famine, and other terrors this morning. We pray for new perspectives, to think outside of the boxes of what is, and for the knowledge and tactical skills to make a better way. We pray for the courage of our hearts to remember change is possible, and for the courage of our voices to call for such change. We pray that those perpetuating violence and division will have changes of heart. We pray that those leaders who have the power to help to solve violence will. We pray we will know how to be shepherds among us, offering the love, comfort, and nurturing we each are uniquely called to offer to our loved ones in the world. In times when we live with regrets, questions, and uncertainties that feel debilitating, shepherd us, help us shepherd one another, to experience your expansive grace, goodness, and mercy all the days of our lives. Help us live as Jesus called us, to extend your shepherding love and care to all we encounter. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Please be seated. I hope you'll join us upstairs for fellowship hour this morning. Cindy, am I remembering correctly that there's a hand chimes rehearsal? So if you're interested in learning hand chimes or being part of that group, Cindy right here can uh, let you know about that. David, thank you for your music this morning. Thanks to Joshua and Tim as well. Thank you to our deacons for guiding our way and to Jared and Stefan for your work on tech. The giants of this world can be intimidating. May you go forth this morning knowing that each person has the tools to make a difference and that we go forth in community and with the shepherding and protecting love of God. Amen. Amen.